First are Dragon Storms. This is the new and deluxe edition of a game that came out some time ago and that I had not played in the previous edition. It is a game based on a general auction mechanic that is in fact most of what you're doing is bidding for resources but it has also a large element of bluffing and deduction as you're trying to figure out what the opponents are going to bid because of course you get something if you just get majority by beating one more than the opponent which is the ideal thing so you're trying not to waste resources so you need to figure out what the opponents are doing and of course and there is also a large element of bluffing as in fact I want to trick my opponents into bidding too much or not bidding enough. So very general, very linear mechanics and again this is just pretty much a sequence of auctions and my fear as I read the rule book was well maybe this is going to be a little too repetitive, just one auction and another auction and another auction. I was a friend the game was going to be repetitive and a little too linear. Oh, was I wrong? Yes, indeed, I was. This game turned out to be much more than that. Let me show how the game works and then I'll tell you what my group and I thought about the game. The game in essence is very simple. The game consists of a sequence of auctions in which players will bid resources to take control of characters and to use the abilities of the characters. You shuffle these characters in a deck, the characters become available one at a time, players will bid. The player that wins the auction uses the ability of the character, gets to do all sorts of crazy stuff. But in essence, you're trying to collect resources, uh, especially dragon stones, that will then tr you will then trade for victory points. You have a victory point tracker here, starts from zero, and the first player to score three points is the winner of the game. Now you have a set of standard characters that will be available every round. The witch and the player that controls the witch will get to take a black magic token that can be spent during that round pretty much to block the ability of one of the following characters and for that reason the witch is always on top, is always the first character, character to get auctioned, it not, does not get shuffled in the deck. Then you have um, a, a set of standard characters that will be available every round. You have dragons, if you manage to be the player that wins the auction for a dragon you get to take a dragon stone of the corresponding color red, yellow or blue. There are also white dragon stones a little harder to come by and they count as, as wild. Then you have the Thief, what's a game without a thief in which you can take stuff from other players? Here you take a dragon stone of your choice from the second highest bid. This is kind of important because it means that when the thief is up, you go all in or you don't go there at all. Because if you don't bid anything, you're gonna be the last player, at least they don't get to steal from you. If you're a first player, you get to steal from somebody, but if you almost got it and you didn't, then not only have you spent all the resources, you also that stuff stolen from you. And then you have cards again that let you tra trade dragon stones for victory points. Here a set of three dragon stones, one of each color, gives you a point. A set of four identical dragon stones scores you two points, which is huge when you only need three to win the game. You can also get other resources, but victory points is what you really want. Any four, doesn't matter the color, you score a point. And then we're back, back here. Now you also have this deck of unique characters that do all sort of crazy stuff. And you can pause and read some of those abilities if you're not familiar with them. At the beginning of the first round, the three are selected randomly and shuffled together with... Uh, together with these ones, with the standard ones, to make the deck. Again, you make that deck. You place the witch on top and then you place this card here called the king's favor at the bottom. So that then the player that wins the last auction will also take the king's favor token, which is this impressive token here. And having the king's favor gives you several advantages. You get a silver the moment you get the king's favor. 
you can uh, then buy cards that nobody wants, you can buy them for cheap, they're just a, a sort of interesting advantages. Also, when you're setting up the next turn, the player with the king's favor gets to draw four cards and chooses one to discard. So, starting from turn two, if somebody has the king's favor, the three that are added to the standard cards are not entirely random, the, king, the player with the king's favor gets to uh, have a say. But in any case, that's how it will look like. Players will have a screen behind the which they have a nice play rate and also they get to hide their resources. They start with a number of fairy gold coins. It's magic gold. After you spend it, it goes back to your purse. Then they have a number of gold coins that once spent go back to the bank. Fairy or common in terms of, of purchase value, how much uh, they are worth, they were the same, they're worth one gold, so that doesn't matter. And then players have a number of silver coins uh, that are used not to bid but to break ties, we'll see what that means, and you start also with a number of dragon stones that are, uh, that are assigned randomly to you. Now. Now, what happens is, uh, starting from the witch, each player selects a number of gold coins from their hand, which, from behind the screen, which can be zero, and then players will place their closed hand the center of the table. This is a game that has fists in the name, and yes, you do play with your fists. Then players will reveal their bid, and lo and behold, the player with the, um, with the highest bid will get to use the ability of the card. If there is a tie for the bid, then players will bid silver and the silver will break the tie. So basically the main bid is based on gold, The and then if there is a tie, you use silver to break the tie. Which seems like meh at the beginning, but trust me, when you know you're the only player with silver because the players have spent all of theirs, then, well, that becomes very important because you only need to tie to win whatever card it is. Yeah, for example, so, for example, I win the witch, and then I can we discard the card. I won the witch, so I get the black magic token. Reveal the next card. Ooh, the red dragon stone. Uh, somebody wants it. Very bad. Somebody doesn't want it all that bad. So we bid. Hooray! This player gets it. So we discard it, and I get a dragon stone. Red dragon stone behind my screen. Blue Dragon Stone, oh, this time we tie, so we go for silver, and, oops, you got it, because I had zero, and so, Blue Dragon Stone it is, and then we go on, so on and so forth, until we get to the crazy cards, and we see what happens, we get to... Uh, again, those important cards that let you come, that let you transform sets of dragonstones into points. We get to the end. We reassign the king's favor if it goes to another player. Otherwise, the player that had it keeps it, and so on and so forth. Now, if there is a perfect tie after the silver, then no one gets the card. So there's some special cases. We tie with the gold, then we use the silver to break the tie. Still a tie. Nobody gets the card. It is discarded. Again, the black magic may block the ability of the card. Also, if no one, no one bids uh, on a certain card, the player with the king's favor may buy it for a single gold. So there are cases in which the king's favor does want that card, but things that maybe no one else wants it. So instead of bidding, you're just going with a zero. You have the king's favor and you hope that everybody places a zero there. And so you're going to get it. The card on the cheap oh, but of course that's also a gamble because maybe there's somebody does bid and so you don't get to do so this is in essence the general idea it seems simple and maybe even disappointingly so but trust me when you take into account uh, all the crazy abilities, no two games will ever be the same, no two rounds will be the same because you have all these cards, there's no chance you're going to use all of them in a single game and so the combinations will be uh, always different, yeah, but the other tokens for the types of effects that unique characters may trigger. So different interactions due to the different combination of cards and of course the different order in which the cards are played. 
a lot of tension as you can imagine from the fact that I get a lucky combo and I get to uh, score so I'm two now I'm a single point uh, and now play from victory and now the players are gonna pay a lot of attention to what I have what's in front of my screen that gives some information of what I have behind the enemy spend what kind of dragon stones I get they will use all sort of, uh, of effects to prevent to prevent me from getting a nice combination of dragon stones that will score me points or they let me have the dragon stones don't let me get access to the cards that lets me turn the dragon stones into victory point so a lot of subtleties there the mechanism is very simple but the options the possibilities the tough decisions are endless my group and I were blown away by this game. Yes, no need to, uh, to, to, to mince words. So we were, wow, we had no idea the game could be so much fun. As I was playing in it and I was thinking uh, about, thinking about the review I was going to film, I thought, this is going to be hard. It's going to be a hard review. The conclusion is going to be hard because I don't know that I can convey how deep and subtle and nuanced and incredibly fun this game is. Uh, rather than give you a full analysis, I may have to go through the testimonial thing. As we're playing the game, trust me, half of the sentences, the words that we said, were about the game itself. Oh my gosh, what are you gonna bid? Oh, the thief, oh, what can we do here? Mm, you bid two, maybe you're gonna bid three, three this time. And the other half was like, Oh my gosh, this is so fun. This is crazy. This is so deep. I had no idea this. I did not expect this game to be so amazing. Wow, wow, wow. As the game was going on. Um, we loved it. We loved it. And again, it would be hard for me to give you a sense without getting into an extremely pedantic analysis. I could show you how a round went and how each card, what happened in that card, made the players create a hypothesis about what the other players were going to do. And the following card, some hypotheses uh, ended up being right and some wrong and players were now making more hypotheses and budgeting, etc, etc. It sounds extremely tedious, but in truth, as you are there, these incredibly simple mechanics and this very clear, clear, and clear understandable pool of resources uh, result into an incredibly complex and fascinating and nuanced galaxy of possible things that you can do. Yes, games about bluffing and deduction are about I'm trying to think what you're thinking, I'm trying to figure out what you think I'm thinking, etc, etc, etc. However, very often um, those games of bluffing are very often are based on sort of like a binary thing, willy or willy not. Um, and so very often games of bluffing and deduction, which I like, end up being a sort of like magnified, um, a glorified rock, paper, scissors. It is hard for me to think of another game that is about bluffing and deduction that actually has so many layers like Fist of Dragonstones. It has so many different things. It is not about will he or will she or will she not. It's about, well, she could play two, two coins of fairy gold or one fairy gold and one common gold or play nothing. So, or da 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 da. Basically, because for each situation, there are many possible things things that my opponents may find desirable and I'm trying to sort through those and many possible things that of course I could do. Um, it just feels there's no single decision that in fact is always good. Bidding a lot can be terrible, bidding nothing can be a very bad idea. Bidding some can be terrible if you are uh, against the thief and then you bid some, somebody else wins the thief and you are the second player, the one that gets stuff stolen from them. Getting the king's favor is really great, but again it comes with its own set of consequences, of temptations. As the king, the play with the king's favor, I may try to hope that no one beats anything because I want to get something for cheap, but then the player knows that they're the king's favor and they may try to do so and now they're gonna get available card for one because they know I'm gonna beat zero. You have to be there. 
you have to be there for really see how these simple ideas result in this very complex uh, system of different deductions and interactions. Most of those go, go on under the surface. It's almost like this conversation, telepathic conversation. I know exactly what he's thinking. I know what she's thinking. I'm thinking, etc., etc. And yet, and yet at the same time, this happens in a way that does not feel confusing, that does not feel cerebral and that's another risk when you have games of deduction that really are complicated then you may feel overwhelmed here i was just presented for every darn card with a pool of possible things that felt that felt just right that have to do with how much i was going to bid how much i thought you were going to bid heck, heck even what was going to be left behind my screen and not just because I'm saving something for future bits but even because of other game effects. Uh, maybe there is a card that I know is coming up that will allow the player to take a resource from behind my screen and so maybe now in my bid I'm also taking into account what I want to take out of my screen which may be wasteful now to spend it now but this way no, you're not gonna get it because when that card comes if you get it, then you cannot steal that resource from me. And turns out maybe I get that card and I go, shoot, that's not what I expected, etc, etc, etc. The game presents you with all sorts of interesting problems to solve all the time. Each interesting, each captivating, fascinating, highly interactive as everything is relative to what, what everybody else is doing. And yet not overwhelming, not cerebral, not that gives you a headache. At the end of the game, I was almost exhausted, mind you, but just because the tension was so intense. I didn't have the kind of headache or the brain burn that I had from very complicated design. This is a game that is complex without being complicated. In fact, it's an incredibly elegant game. By elegant here meaning a game that does a lot with little, that has this beautiful disproportion between how simple the mechanics are and how new ones and rich experience that emanates from the game can be. Feast of Dragon Stones, an intensely social game, an intensely a tactical game, a game that is deep and yet simple, that is captivating, that has huge replay value because of the different combinations of cards that you will have each time. A great game, definitely one of the best games that I played in 2018, that's how much I'm liking it. This game is not going to be in my top five games at the end of the year. Uh, well, either we had a Stratus Theoric fall and winter one that an unprecedentedly amazing or maybe I hit my head and I forgot about it because there's no other way that this game is not going to be one of my favorite games of 2018. I loved it immensely. If you haven't given it a try yet, please do so. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to your group. Wonderful friendships may emerge from here because you may realize things about your friends that you didn't know and maybe wonderful friendship will end around the table where people are playing Face of Dragon Souls but either way you're not going to regret playing this game because it is just such a blast.